Since time immemorial, indigenous people have lived, traveled, and traded in the Puget Sound region. The Donation Land Act of 1850 to encourage westward expansion allowed American settlers to claim these traditional native lands. The explosion of immigration into the region that followed forced the U.S. government into a fraught treaty-making process with local tribes. The original terms of the Medicine Creek Treaty were inadequate and ultimately unaccepted by tribal leaders resulting in war. The Indigenous Voices podcast is an extension of the award-winning Puget Sound Treaty War Panel series from Fort Nisqually Living History Museum. The podcast advances tribal voices in the telling of Puget Sound history and shares tribal knowledge and expertise with wider audiences. In our last episode, we discussed how the modern food sovereignty movement relates to the protection of treaty rights won in the Puget Sound Treaty War. In this episode, we discuss how language revitalization programs are connected to tribal identity and tribal resilience. We speak with two language keepers, Janice hicks Bullchild, a language student from the Nisqually tribe, and Rose Davis, a language teacher from the Muckleshoot tribe of Indians. To all Gwalapu Si'i to all my honorable relatives, Yeham Sitsta, I use the pronoun she, her. Yeham is my Indian name. J. Hicks Bullchild Sitsta. J. Hicks Bullchild is my English name. To all Todd Squaliox, I'm from the Squally. But it said, A T2 Ben Hicks Sr., Yessi Wapiti Makwa. I am the child of the late Ben Hicks Sr. and Donna Choke. E Botch Ted, E T2 Kiki Bino, Dupuy, Yes T2 Ray Hicks, Yes C Sustabo P, Yessi. To Virginia Hicks. I am the grandchild of the late Joe Dupuy and, and the late Ray Hicks and the late Hazel Pete and the late Virginia Hicks. Dite hash to Susquotash Altislahe. It is good we gather on this day. Hatslahe Tokolapu, Rose Davis Sitsta, Tal Chad Bakoshut, Atzata Bakoshut Sito Squatchi Twa. Good day, everyone. My name is Rose Davis, and I am a Muckleshoot tribal member, as well as a language teacher for the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. Currently, I serve as infants and toddlers at our CCDF Infant and Toddler Center. Um, thank you for having me today, and it is good to see all of you. Lushitseed is a Puget Salish language, and it's composed of two subgroup dialects, which is the northern dialect and the southern dialect. Well, within those dialects, you'll have and you will see um, village dialects. To give you an example, within the Muckleshoot tribe, you will hear a lot of variations. And those variations are because those translations are those ways of speaking that comes from family villages. Even though we live on Muckleshoot today, um, our families, you know, lived in a vast region. And when um, families, you know, had to pick up and come to this area, each of those villages kind of had their own dialect. And they're very similar to where you can understand the village next to you and going up north, you can still understand. I feel like Lushitsi just kind of came naturally. And I have, I've never told anybody this before, but when I started learning in high school and I had a Lushitsi class with Miss Verna and she had asked me, you know, for some extra credit if I could speak Lushitsi at our graduation ceremony. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. You know, not really thinking much of it. And I can look back to that day and I had this paper in front of me, you know, and I was just reading it. And I didn't know like if I was speaking it right. I didn't know, you know, what I was saying, but it just felt 
natural and it, it, everything just went calm. Like it just felt like I've had it before, but you know, that was my, you know, my first experience around language. And, but then after that, I feel like the language just kind of, kind of kept following me. And so finally I was like, okay, um, I'm, I'm a language teacher now, you know, like it came real naturally actually, because I remember when I first started out in our language program here in Muckleshoot, um, we were, to, we were supposed to train for eight hours a day um, but one of our elder teachers, she had fallen ill and had to retire. And so they pulled me and put me into the classes and I just started going and I just didn't and I haven't stopped. <laughs> and luckily and thankfully, I was blessed, you know, to to have it come like second nature. So I started taking the language in 2019, fall quarter at Northwest Indian College and COVID happened in March of uh, 2020. My language classes still happened at Northwest Indian College, but it was through Zoom. And I was also taking a class at Nisqually Elders and that was in person. Well, when COVID happened, that shut down. And I was really eager to learn the language. So I started reaching out to other tribes. They a post on Facebook about language with uh, Muckleshoot with Rose Davis, and I started taking her class. And then I got the information from Pialup, and I started taking their class. And then I started, I reached out to another person, and I started taking his class. I used the Pialup language website a lot, and then I also used uh, Tulalip, even though that's northern, but I was just really eager to learn the language. It was okay for me to learn um, different village dialects, Northern, Southern. So that way I could understand everyone, not just one village or one dialect. I would like to be certified one day and to teach the younger generation, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> So currently I work with infants and toddlers. This is my eighth year teaching the shoot seed uh, within my community as well. I've, I've, I've be, actually began servicing um, uh, our neighboring school districts with a combination of language and some of our history. When I first started working, I worked with Head Start ages three to five. Um, after that, I taught kindergarten first and second. And um, for a couple of years during um, COVID, I worked with adults and adult learners. This is my first year actually working with infants and toddlers. Our youngest baby right now, she's three months old, and um, our oldest child is three years old. Um, I go into the classroom for four hours a day, and I use nothing but the shoot seed. Because they're so young and they're still learning language, it's not foreign to them. It's It's natural it's very natural <laughs> and it's been really cool because I've been able to work with the teachers before we got our babies and I taught them you know basic language around changing diapers around um, guiding kids to sit down to eat at the table and our teachers here are they are using it in the classroom they're just absorbing everything. It's actually quite funny because one of our girls, she's here every single day. And um, the teacher's favorite word is gorilla, which means to sit down. If you say sit down, she doesn't understand you because she's so used to hearing gorilla. And so when, you know, a new teacher or a substitute teacher comes in, there she's like looking at him and she's not sitting down. And then the other assistant will walk by and say gorilla and she plops down. It's really exciting to, you know, I, I want to see the future, you know, where are we going to be at four years from now? For me, once I learned the alphabet, um, I, I picked up on it pretty quick. Um, there are some characters that I still get mixed up, but um, I just have to sound it out and then I'll get it practice and just repetitive and I speak and read and write it every day and so just so I don't lose it and so I speak it to my husband my husband doesn't know what I'm saying he picks up on it I was like wow 
you know what you just said? <laughs> Are you ready? As Quebec of Chapel. Are you ready? Hey, as Quebec of Chad. Yes, I'm ready. Because, you know, I don't have a lot of people that I can speak to with it on a regular basis. So I'll speak to my cats and I'll speak to my dog and my dog is learning it too. <laughs> so yeah, it comes, it, it's starting to come natural. And for me, it's, I really like it because some of the combinations is, is nothing like in English and it's just fun. It's just fun just to the different sounds that our language makes. I'm really grateful that, uh, that I am able to uh, learn it. And my early um, stages of learning the language, it was, a, you know, slightly more difficult because this language, once you fully understand it, you totally look at life very differently. And that connection to the land is really what ties everything together. Because once I started going out and gathering, once I started going out and just being in nature and using the language, that was, you know, one of the things that I had, you know, made myself do is anytime I go and gather, I always use the language because, um, you know, those plants, those animals, you know, that's what they've heard for thousands and thousands of years. But once I did that, um, the language made more sense in a way. When we have these variations and different dialects within the language, that language ties back to our ancestral villages. And depending on where you lived, you know, depending on what the things you were doing during that time, you know, might be your word for that month. Whereas someone over here in this area, it's going to be different um, depending on, you know, what the weather is like there, what's available there. And so the language naturally ties and just integrates with the land. Sometimes the language will almost mimic a sound from the land or it's very descriptive. What you see is how a word, you know, might be spoken. Ocean, for example. Um, and just imagine the, the sounds that, you know, the ocean, those waves make when they come in onto the shore. Uh, the way that our people speak ocean is hoch. And, it, and it, it's almost mimicking that sound of that wave crashing into the land, hoch. Learning the shoot seed, uh, looking back, I've noticed that there are a few changes to some of our words, and and I, I haven't figured it out exactly why yet. But uh, for example, the time of December, when I first started learning, it was so shoots a lot, and that is, you know, it means to put your paddles away. And during that time, you know, when it's getting cold. Um, People are going back into their longhouses for the winter. And today we have a new word. And I'm not exactly sure why it changed. And it might be due to, you know, a certain person living differently. Maybe that person's not putting paddles away anymore because they're not on their canoes as much. I, I, I can't, you know, say for sure. But again, depending on where a family might live or depending on where that family originally came from you know that might have and again you know with Makoshui we are composed of many different villages and so um, but we get to embrace all of our dialects all of those village dialects. Canoe journey uh, that's where I really wanted to learn the language because I would hear Everybody speaking different languages, not just Lesuti. And it's just really neat to see other canoe families speaking their language and introducing themselves or coming ashore. And so I was like, wow, I want to do that. I want to learn my language. I want to learn Lesuti. I want to be able to introduce myself, ask to come ashore um, in my language. Before I started learning the language, um, we have tribal events. And they have, they will have like t-shirts with the language on there. And so I'd be wearing a t-shirt and people would ask me, what does that say? How do you say that? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? And I was like, I don't know. And it kind of made me feel a certain way. Like, gosh, I don't even know my own language. I mean, I understand why. So that kind of made me um, want to learn the language so I could read it. and. 
And so now when I see stuff on cups or T-shirts or pencils or whatever, or on an ad or a flyer, oh, I know what that says. Or I will look in my dictionary and I will try to figure it out. And also for me, so that way I can um, teach the younger generation and teach my family so I can also be a, a language keeper for, for Nisqually. Uh, growing up up until high school, it's kind of sad to say, but I didn't know and I wasn't aware that I had a language. You know, I was exposed to a lot of the language signage throughout our tribe. But, you know, as a kid growing up, you kind of really pay attention to that stuff. As I got older, again, going back to high school um, with my language instructor, you know, signing me this work, it kind of, you know, got me thinking and I was interested. And I started to listen a lot more you know, I didn't lo- I didn't carry a lot of knowledge pertaining tribal history. Once I found out and once, you know, I came to realization, you know, that my normal life is based on this, you know, foundation of my family, my ancestors, my great great grandparents fighting for, you know, what we have today, you know, then it like, you know, kind of like hit me in the heart. Once I was aware, you know, of our treaty wars, of what happened to our people, of our grandparents, you know, who went through boarding schools. I realized because my family, my ancestors, my elders fought so hard and have um, went through all of this pain and suffered, um, they survived for us. And it is now my duty to take this language and to help our people heal and to um, bring it back. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, thinking about that. You know, I've heard stories about what's happened. And then you go back and you see all this trauma from generation to generation to generation. And even in my generation, I didn't know why, why things you know, her as much as, like, I had average stress, you know, just like my co-students at Auburn High School, and, but for some reason, it felt like I was more suppressed, or I, I was, you know, embarrassed to say that I was Muckleshoot, that I was Native, and once you figure out why you have, and you carry all of these feelings, it almost gives you this power and courage to stand up and to be proud of yourself where you come from and I feel like the language is it's us you know that like this is a part of ourselves that had been cut off and cut off really hard and now we're in a time where it's okay to speak our language and it's 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 a time to heal and the reason why I teach is because I want my girls to have that natural connection just like right. our ancestors did I don't want them to grow up and I don't want I don't want it to be lost after everything our warriors have been through I don't I don't want to lose it and I want it to come back and I want it to be strong and I want our people to be proud of it. Thank you for listening. Be sure to join us monthly as we continue the conversation among diverse communities impacted by the treaty war and its aftermath. To learn more about the Puget Sound Treaty War, visit our tribal partner websites and fortnesqually.org, where you can watch our four-part panel series on the conflict. This podcast is generously supported by the Tacoma Historic Preservation Office and the Tacoma Arts Commission. Music by Vincent Johnson, Nooksack Lummy, and Nishani Johnson, Jamestown Sklalem Lummy.